Uh, I'm Hong Liu. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Hong Liu from MIT. Yeah, I'm the introducer and the co-host of today's lecture. Welcome to the 2021 Aspen Center for Physics, Heinz R. Pagel's Physics Talks, an online the series usually offered at the center. We are uh, pleased that uh, you have found your way uh, to the talk this evening. For those of you who are not familiar with the Aspen Center for Physics, I would like to spend a few minutes uh, first telling you about the center. Uh, the center is an institution really beloved by physicists all over the world. In normal times, every summer, over about 16 week period, about like 400 uh, leading scientists from all over the world, they come to the center. And each uh, for, uh, for a few weeks, they share and discuss recent development, exchange and sharpen ideas, and also to collaborate. I'm very happy to report that this year, the center is at half of the normal capacity. And actually the center is planning to have in-person lectures uh, this, coming, uh, uh, this coming winter. And now uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Tracy Slatia from MIT. Tracy grew up in Australia and Fiji. She had her bachelor with honor uh, from uh, Australian uh, National University. Then moved to Harvard in 2006 for her PhD. From 2010 and 2013, she was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and then moved to MIT uh, uh, in 2013. Tracy has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of the universe. In 2010, with Douglas um, Fink Banner and Mensu, she discovered the Fermi bubbles, a mysterious uh, uh, structure of high energy gamma rays bubbling out of the, uh, from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. In 2015, she convincingly argued against the popular uh, argument at the time that the gamma ray excess observed uh, in the center, in the galactic center, may have been caused by dark matter. And instead, she pointed out it is likely by a previously unknown population of faint and mysterious uh, uh, astrophysical objects, uh, 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 probably pulsars. Tracy has also been a world leading expert on dark matter signatures in the early universe and the models of dark matter uh, interacting uh, through uh, uh, new forces. Tracy has also been um, recognized by many awards and honors. Uh, so here I only have time to mention a few. So that includes 2021 New Horizons Prize from the Breakthrough Foundation and 2019 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. 2017 Henry Primakov Award for Early Career Particle Physics at American Physical Society, and 2014 uh, Bruno, Bruno Rossi Prize by American Astronomy, uh, Astronomical Society. So uh, during the lecture, we will not interrupt Tracy uh, uh, so you will be muted. If you have a question, you can raise your hand by clicking the hand at the bottom of your screen during the Q&A sessions at the end, and I will call on you. Okay. So we will wrap up, say, about uh, 6.30. Okay. And uh, uh, today's lecture will be recorded and will be available on, tube, uh, on YouTube uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. So now let me uh, give the stage to Tracy. Um, thanks very much, Hong, and thanks very much to the Aspen Center for Physics for inviting me. Um, I visited Aspen on several occasions, as, as you will hear during this talk, and um, it's great. I look forward to being back there in person. Um, but yeah, this summer, I'm glad to be able to talk to you over Zoom. So yeah, as Hong mentioned, I want to tell you about some puzzles in the highest energy light coming from our Milky Way galaxy that I and many other people have been working on and trying to sort out for the last decade or so. So I want to begin by just giving you a bit of background about, you know, why are we interested in looking at the highest energy light from the Milky Way galaxy and where do we think it comes from? What did we expect to see when we looked 
uh, the sky with telescopes capable of detecting this very high, this very high energy um, gamma ray emission. And then after that, then I want to start telling you about what we saw when we actually did look at the sky with a telescope capable of seeing um, this light. And one of those was the Fermi bubbles that Hong just mentioned. So I'll tell you a little bit about that, about what they are, and about how they might relate to the supermassive black hole at the very center of our galaxy. A theme which I'm going to hit again and again is very high energy light, which we'll call gamma rays, tells us about the most energetic processes occurring in our galaxy and can allow us to really try to unravel the history of high energy events in our galaxy. So after we've talked about the Fermi bubbles for a bit, then I'll tell you about this galactic center excess that Hong also mentioned, which is a glow of gamma rays coming from the heart of the Milky Way. And by the end of this lecture, hopefully you'll be able to explain what we see um, and some of the, the ideas we have for where it might originate, but we still don't know the answer to this question. These are open questions that I'll be telling you about this evening. One possibility, maybe the leading possibility, is that what we're seeing is a new population of neutron stars pulsating and emitting gamma rays. Another possibility um, is that this could even be telling us about a clue to dark matter in our universe. And those of us, who, those of you who were at last week's public lecture will know all about dark matter, but I'll give a bit of a review for, uh, for those of you who don't. And I want to talk about, you know, what, what are the possible clues to telling the differences between these, where we are and where we may go in the next couple of years. Okay, so the, the setting for our talk tonight is the Milky Way galaxy. This photograph on the left is a time-lapse photograph taken from a point on the coast of Australia, which as Hong mentioned is where I'm from and where I grew up. So if you've been to the Southern Hemisphere, you may be familiar with this band of bright stars across the sky, which is the Milky Way. So that band is the plane of our galaxy. These sketches on the right are picture artists' impressions of what our galaxy looks like from the European Space Agency. So if we could look at our galaxy from outside and look down, we would see that there's a spiral disk with this bright bulge of stars at the center. And on the bottom is the edge on view. So because we live inside the galaxy, we live in one of these spiral arms about 25,000 light years out from the center. And this is the position, this is the approximate position of the sun marked here. When we look up at the sky, we, we see something like this edge on view of the galaxy. And that's this band of stars that is the Milky Way. So this is what the galaxy looks like in visible light and the light that you know, illuminates everything that we see from day to day. But the galaxy also shines in light of many different frequencies. It shines in radio waves, it shines in microwave, and it shines in the highest energy light that is gamma rays. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to be using the term gamma rays a lot uh, in the context of this lecture. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves, which have um, wavelengths that can be the size of buildings or larger through your visible light, which has wavelengths you know, comparable to the size of bacteria. Um, but today we're going to be mostly focusing on really, really high energy light, which has wavelengths so short that they're comparable to the size of an atomic nucleus. Um, so you can ask, okay, what makes this very high energy light and why do we wanna look for it? So the processes that produce um, particles of light that are this energetic have to be um, very violent. And I'll give you some examples of them in, uh, in future lectures. But for this reason, these, um, Gamma rays are quite rare compared to visible light. There aren't that many of them from our galaxy, but they tell us about the most energetic processes that are occurring through our galaxy now and have occurred through our galaxy in the past. And in particular, the most common source of these high energy gamma rays in our galaxy is collisions between high energy charged particles traveling very close to the speed of light, smashing into the gas and the radiation field of our galaxy. Um, and we call these particles cosmic rays. Another just you know, piece of jargon that I'm going to be using later in this talk is the energy scale. So the energy of these gamma rays will often use units called giga electron volts or GeV. So just for calibration, the energy of the ordinary light coming from my light bulb that is you know, shining on me and illuminating us in the Zoom call is about one electron volt. So a giga electron volt is a billion electron volts. So we're talking about light that has about a billion times the energy of visible light. Okay, so that's what we're going to look for. We're going to look at the galaxy shining in this light. We're going to use this to tell us about um, energetic events and processes uh, and systems within our galaxy. Okay, so let's now ask the question of what do we expect to see when we look at our Milky Way and gamma rays, when we do that same observation on the first slide, but now looking at the Milky Way, not in visible light, but in very high energy light. 
So the Milky Way is a sea of very high energy charged particles. And when a cosmic ray proton comes in at high velocity and strikes a proton in the interstellar gas or a hydrogen atom, it can produce unstable particles called pions. Now, some of these pions are neutral and neutral pions decay about 100% of the time into high energy gamma rays. And this is what we believe is the source of about 80 to 90% of all the gamma rays coming from our galaxy is the sea of high energy charged particles slamming into the gas. So if you want to look for any other kind of process in our galaxy, you have to understand how to model that emission and how to, and how to remove it, how to remove that background. If I ask, so what is this picture going? So what is the resulting emission from cosmic rays striking the gas and making gamma rays going to look like? Then I can, I can make a plot that looks like this. So here, what we're doing is we're taking um, the whole map of the sky. So the, the sky is, you know, is a sphere, it would be a sphere if we could see the whole of it uh, with the earth not blocking our way. So we've taken that whole image of the sky and we've spread it out onto this rectangle, just like taking a map of the earth and spreading it out onto a rectangular map. And we've rotated the image such that the, um, such that the plane of the galaxy, this thick disk of stars and gas and light in the Milky Way is running, along the, is running along the center of the image. And we call this the galactic plane or the galactic equator. And so you can see, so here um, white and yellow represent more gas density, red and black represent less gas density. So you can see that most of the gas, so this is a plot of the distribution of um, interstellar dust and gas in the Milky Way. Most of it is along the plane of the Milky Way. And so that's where we expect most of the gamma ray emission to be as well, because there are many targets for the cosmic ray protons to smash into and make pions, which hence make gamma rays. Uh, but you can see that there's still a lot of emission away from the plane as well. There are gas clouds above and below the galactic disk um, surrounding us in the galaxy. And so we expect to see gamma ray emission from those as well. In addition to this process of high energy um, charged protons or charged nuclei of hydrogen atoms smashing into each other out there in space, we can also get gamma rays from high energy electrons um, interacting with just ordinary starlight photons. When a high energy electron um, interacts with an ordinary starlight photon, it can transfer across a large chunk of its energy. And so that converts the starlight photon into a high energy gamma ray. And thus, and so we also expect to see a gamma ray glow in regions where we have lots of starlight and lots of cosmic ray electrons. So we can take that information, you know, we, we have reasonable estimates of how these charged particles are distributed through the galaxy and how the gas is distributed through the galaxy and how the, and how the stars are distributed through the galaxy. And we can, you know, add these ingredients into, into this recipe and come up with a prediction for what the Milky Way should look like in gamma rays. So this is again, this map of the whole gamma ray sky, black means more gamma rays, white means fewer gamma rays. And this is the kind of emission that we expect to see just from charged particles interacting, high energy, close to the speed of light particles interacting with the rest of the galaxy. So anything that we see on top of this um, could be telling us about something other than these charged particles interacting with the gas and starlight. Okay. So, so, this, so having got this model, we can look at the actual data in gamma rays from the galaxy, compare the two. We can use that to try to tell us about the population of cosmic rays passing through our galaxy. But when we see something in the data that we didn't expect from this, it, it may tell us about something new that, we don't, that we don't currently understand. And that's the origin of the puzzles that we're going to discuss. Okay. so. Hope we're, so we're put through the first part of the talk at this point. So the highest energy light in the Milky Way, where does it come from? I hope you now have a pretty good idea of where a lot of these gamma rays come from. Uh, of course, the rest of the talk is now going to tell you about gamma rays where we're not sure where they come from and the ongoing puzzle is where do they come from? So let me now tell you about the Fermi bubbles and how we discovered them. So to do this, we're going to have to look at, uh, at some data. So the data that, we, that I'm gonna be showing you throughout this talk comes from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So this is a mission of NASA and the Department of Energy that was launched from Cape Canaveral on, June to, on 11th June, 2008. And this is a photograph of the launch. So Fermi is, uh, you know, is, is, about a, is about a square meter instrument. It's now up in space. It's orbiting the earth at a 340 mile altitude and it's been doing so for the last 13 years. Uh, it goes around the Earth about once every 90 minutes, and it, and it, um, it sees about um, a third of the sky at the time. 
but it rocks back and forth on every orbit. So we can watch the entire sky over every two orbits. So it sees the entire sky in about every three hours. It's sensitive to gamma rays from about 0.3 GeV. So that's about 300 million times the energy of visible light up to several thousand GeV. So that's several trillion times the energy of visible light. So it's a really great window on our high energy galaxy and high energy universe. And the Fermi collaboration makes all their data public. So you or I or anyone can go to their website site and download the latest data from this space telescope at any time. And it's just been an incredible resource for um, the science and for understanding our galaxy. So suppose we take that data, we go to their website, we download the data, we make a map of what the galaxy looks like in gamma rays, and we ask what we see. So this is what my collaborators and I saw when we looked at this data back in 2010. So here we're picking out specifically photons that have energies between about two giga electron volts and five giga electron volts. Here again, black means more gamma rays, white means fewer gamma rays. And this is again a map of the galaxy where the galactic plane is running um, along the horizontal axis here. And you can see like at first, at first, at first glance, this looks pretty much what we, like what we expected. This was what our model looked like. This is what our data looks like. You see in both cases, we see there's a lot of gamma ray emission along the galactic plane. There's some gamma ray emission above and below the plane. There are these gas clouds um, above the plane, which show up both in our prediction and in the data. So you know, this all looks pretty good. Um, I will say the, these white spots on the map, these are not real. These are artifacts. They correspond to places where there's a very bright, bright gamma ray emitting star in the data. And so we've cut out the region of the sky where that gamma ray emitting star appears just, just to prevent it from contaminating the region around it. Uh, this map is also a bit processed. We've, we've fitted for a whole bunch of gamma ray emitting stars and gamma ray emitting distant galaxies in this image and remove them. So what's left is what we think is, the, is what we call the diffuse gamma ray emission, which means not from individual stars that we can pick out as stars associated with our galaxy. But if you have very keen eyes and you know what you're looking for, you might already have noticed that there are some things in this image that are not in our background model of what the galaxy should look like. So to illuminate those things, we can subtract off our model for the emission that should be associated with cosmic rays interacting with the gas and starlight and see what, if anything, is left. If this was describing everything in the galaxy, we would expect to see basically just zero when we do the subtraction, but that's not what we see. So what we, this is what happens when we take the difference of the two. And I'm just gonna sketch you, you see here that there's this sort of figure eight shaped structure around the center of the galaxy. I'll highlight it for you in red there. So these are what's called the Fermi bubbles. So these are these large bubbles and lobes, which my collaborators and I first described back in 2010. And they're still somewhat of an unresolved puzzle, although we know a lot more about them than we did in 2010. So here is a slightly prettier image of the bubbles that has been colored to make them to make them stand out a bit more. So let me say a couple of things about these bubbles. First recall, this is a map of the entire sky. This is the entire celestial sphere um, packed down to a rectangle. So when we see that these bubbles take up a significant fraction of the you know, vertical height of this image, that means they're enormous. These things, each of these things is about 50 degrees wide on the sky. We're about 25,000 light years from the galactic center. So that means that these bubbles are about 20 to 30,000 light years tall. So they're truly galactic scale structures. They shine brightly in gamma rays between, I showed you before data from the two to five GeV range, but they shine brightly in gamma rays from about one to 100 GeV in energy. We've also ob observed them in very different ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum at this point. These are also shining in X-rays and in microwaves. So there are many puzzling features of these bubbles and their origin is still somewhat of an open question. But let me tell you about one possible explanation for where these things could come from. So these bubbles could be associated with the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. We have very good evidence that the center of the Milky Way hosts a black hole with the mass of about 4 million times our sun. So, and this is an artist's impression of the black hole and we know that went, so you might say, well, that artist's impression is not very black, like this, you know, doesn't everything just fall into black holes and nothing ever, ever comes out. But we know that as matter falls onto black holes, it can perturb the region around the black hole and cause it to, and cause the region around the black hole to emanate highly energized jets of material. And we see these jets in other galaxies. We call them active galactic nuclei. We haven't 
seen a jet like that from the black hole in our galaxy and, and our galaxy's black hole is usually thought to be you know pretty quiet it's just crumbling along minding its own business and not doing anything very exciting but the fermi bubbles may be a signal that a few million years ago it was much more active and emitted a jet like this this is uh this plot here is a plot from a scientific paper by my colleagues um yang and Ruskowski, uh who did who have done some simulations looking well, at saying okay if we've had in the past had some kind of dramatic jet uh, streaming out from the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, then what would that look like today? And what they simulated was as the jet punches out from the black hole, it causes a shock wave that expands out and around the jet in this bubble-like structure that you can see in this lower plot. And so that you can see is so, somewhat resembles the Fermi bubble shapes that we looked at in the last couple of slides. And so this is one leading hypothesis for what might be going on, that the bubbles are actually, you know, the relics several million years later of a very energetic event involving the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Another possibility is that they could have been fueled by a large number of supernovae going off, so stars exploding violently in the region around the center of the Milky Way in, in the past of our galaxy. So the Fermi bubbles really give us a bit of an insight into galactic archaeology. Okay, so now I want to tell, so the bubbles are a really interesting open puzzle, but we have some good ideas for what might be creating them. So now I want to move on and tell you about what happens when instead of looking at the bubbles, we look at the region right around the center of the Milky Way, around this, you know, around this supermassive black hole and the region surrounding it, because it turns out that there's also some additional unresolved puzzles going on in that region. So we're now going to move from the bubbles down to the galactic center region. So this is where we are in the talk. We've talked about the, where the highest energy light in the Milky Way comes from. We've talked about the Fermi bubbles, what we mean by the Fermi bubbles and how they might relate to the black hole. So now I'm gonna tell you about puzzle number two, sometimes called the galactic center excess, which is a glow of gamma rays from the heart of the galaxy. And so we'll talk about what do we see and where do we think it might be coming from. Okay, so onto the galactic center region. So just as we did for the, so for the Fermi bubbles, we took, we looked at our data, we took a model of what we expected to see, which was mostly, you know, emission associated with the disk of our galaxy full of gas and stars. We subtracted it off and we looked at the difference. So we can do exactly the same thing in the galactic center region. And these two images up here are showing the result of such an analysis by Abizajin and Kaplinghat in 2012. The plot on the left, so now here, this isn't the whole sky anymore. We've zoomed down to a much smaller region. Um, about seven degrees square surrounding the galactic center. But um, so this plot on the left is showing what the background looks like. So now red means more emission, green means less emission, blue means least emission. And again, we see the galactic plane is shining pretty brightly in gamma rays. But there's this bright emission around the center that we didn't actually expect to see. When we subtract off our best model for what the galactic plane should look like, what we're left with is this fuzzy blob of emission centered on the galactic center in the right-hand panel. And you can do this for different, for gamma rays of different energies, starting at the lowest energy gamma rays that Fermi can see and going up to the highest energy gamma rays that Fermi can see. And this blob is most pronounced the gamma ray energies between about one and three GeV. That incidentally is pretty different from the Fermi bubbles, which extend up to about hundred GeV. So the observation of this excess was first made in 2009 by two of my colleagues called Lisa Goodenough and Dan Hooper. And they were really focusing on the region right around the center of the galaxy. And you look at this blob, you say, okay, this, this seems like it extends about one degree from the galactic center. It's pretty localized on the galactic center. Maybe it has something to do with the black hole. However, in 2013, Dan Hooper and I showed that this is a bit misleading, that this emission is brightest at the galactic center, but it actually extends and is detectable for at least 5,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. So it fills the whole region of the inner Milky Way. I'm going to tell you this story in a bit of detail since this all happened at the Aspen Center for Physics. So this was at one of those Aspen Center for Physics summer workshops in 2012. And I was there and I had been working on the Fermi bubbles. And so was Dan Hooper, who had been working on this galactic center excess. And Dan had asked me, you know, Tracy, how well can we disentangle the Fermi bubbles from whatever might be going on? At the, in the galactic center region, like how well can we extrapolate the bubbles down to low latitudes? 
And he was particularly interested in understanding, you know, maybe if the bubbles were shining in the microwaves and the gamma rays, maybe we could use that data to try to disentangle the bubbles from what else might be going on in the galactic setup. So I said, okay, Dan, sounds like a good idea. I went back to my office. Now, when we initially studied the Fermi bubbles, we had really focused on the region a long way away from the galactic plane, just because as you saw in these images, the galactic plane is really bright. There's a lot of background. So we wanted to look in regions where there was more signal and less background. And so we'd focus on regions far from the galactic center. But there at Aspen in 2012 in my office, I decided to you know, try to go in closer to the galactic center and see how the bubbles appeared to be behaving there. So this, this plot is the most technical plot in the entire talk. So it's okay if you do not understand everything in it. I'll try to explain what, what's going on here. So this is a plot of the amount of power associated of the amount of power in gamma rays as a function of the energy of those gamma rays associated with different subregions of the galactic sky after we subtract out and account for the background model that, we, that I told you about before. Um, so Actually, this red line at the top is telling us about the energy distribution of the photons in the background model. Um, what these other colored lines are all telling you about is if you look within just some subregion of the Fermi bubbles, um, how much power is there in gamma rays, the gamma rays of different energies within each of these subregions. So the regions we had looked at previously when the stu we studied the Fermi bubbles were these purple and blue regions which are a long way from, from the base of the bubbles at the galactic center. And you can see that if you look at these purple and blue lines, they're basically telling you that the power in gamma rays is almost independent of energy across this range. Like there's a lot of power at one GeV, there's a lot of power at 10 GeV, there's a lot of power at 100 GeV. So, you know, the, the signal is like almost independent of energy. And the same is true in the green region, and the same is true in the yellow region. And, you know, I looked at these and was like, oh, the bubbles look like they just have a really similar flat distribution of the amount of gamma ray power with respect to energy, um, even in pretty close to the galactic center. But then we looked at this orange region, which was within about 10 degrees of the galactic center, which again is about a 5,000 light year distance. And we saw something very different. We saw this orange line. So you can see that this, in this orange line, there's actually a ton of extra power in gamma rays at energies around you know, one to three GeV, sort of this range. And I looked at that and was like, huh, that looks just like this galactic center excess that Dan Hooper and Lisa Goodenough have been studying for the last couple of years. So then I thought, oh, well, maybe this region at the very galactic center is contaminating my study. So I cut out all the information, all the photons, that were coming from within five degrees of the galactic plane. And this bump was still there. And it was, it was just as prominent. So I was like, huh, okay. So the galactic center excess is not just a galactic center excess. It fills the whole region within 10 degrees of the galactic center. And I, I printed off this plot or a plot very much like this plot. I went off running to find Dan Hooper, who at that point, I mean, this was in the evening and I think he was watching a baseball game at one of the bars in Aspen. So I, you know, found him, ran up to him with my piece of paper and was like, Dan, look, the galactic center excess is in the base of the Fermi bubbles. And that really helped open the door to studying this excess and trying to understand it, because now we knew that it probably wasn't something associated just with the black hole at the very center of the Milky Way or just the very inner region of the Milky Way. This was, again, a really extended um, gamma ray signal that extended for thousands of light years outside the galactic center. Okay, so now the question, so that's what we see. We see this glow of gamma ray emission filling the region of the inner galaxy, peaking at energies around one to three giga electron volts. So then the question becomes, okay, you know, what is this? And in the rest of my talk, what I wanna tell you about is sort of the, um, the, this puzzle and how, and some different ways that people are trying to attack it and some different possibilities for what the answer could be. So the first possibility that you might think of is, you know, I've told you about the Fermi bubbles. I've told you that, you know, they probably come from some kind of jet from the black hole or from outflow, some outflow from the galactic center region. So maybe something similar could be making this galactic center excess. Another possibility I told you earlier that we had had to cut out some regions of the analysis because they were really bright gamma ray emitting stars. So maybe what we're looking at here is a collection of many gamma ray emitting stars distributed around the center of the galaxy. Uh, and as Hong mentioned, this is perhaps the leading hypothesis at the moment, but I'll try to let you understand why that is the case. And the other possibility that got particle physicists very excited 
is that maybe we could, these gamma rays could be coming from some physics that we don't understand at all from colliding dark matter particles, just as gamma rays are made from colliding. We've already said that we know gamma rays come from colliding protons. Maybe colliding dark matter particles could similarly produce gamma rays, in which case this would be a clue to the dark matter of the universe, which we do not currently understand. So let me talk a little bit about these different hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is that, you know, maybe there was some event in the galactic center, like a jet from the black hole or a series of supernova explosions that made lots and lots of high energy particles. And as these high energy particles streamed out from the galactic center, they, um, they collided with the gas, they collided with the starlight, and through the mechanisms that we talked about at the beginning of the talk, they made this glow of gamma rays. That's completely possible. Like we, we think that's how the Fermi bubbles are being created, as I mentioned earlier. But it has some potential pitfalls as an explanation for this galactic center excess that I told you about. So one of these is, you know, we said early on, if, that, if the light comes from proton cosmic rays hitting other protons in the gas, making pions which decay to gamma rays, then we expect that signal to be brighter where there's a lot of gas, just like our background model was brighter along the galactic plane where there's a lot of gas. But the galactic center axis doesn't look like the plane of our galaxy. It looks like a fuzzy, roughly spherical blob in the center of the galaxy. So, um, so this doesn't really look like a signal coming from some kind of high energy particles hitting the gas. It could come from high energy electron cosmic rays, which uh, um, as they stream out from the center of the galaxy, they occasionally encounter starlight photons, give all their energy to the starlight photon and turn it into a gamma ray. Um, that's pretty possible. But the issue there is that we think we know pretty well how electrons lose their energy as they stream through the galaxy. And by the time they've traveled 5,000 light years, we would have expected them to lose quite a lot of energy. So if they were really getting all their energy at the galactic center and then streaming out, we would expect that there would be less, that the gamma rays further out from the center would be lower energies than the gamma rays closer into the center. But in fact, when we do this analysis, we find that the gamma rays 5,000 light years out from the center seem to be peaked at energies of around one to three GeV same as at the center. So that's, that makes it a bit harder to explain the galactic center excess through this kind of behavior, although it's, it's not, definitely not completely ruled out, but it makes it a bit harder to explain. So then the second possibility is what we're looking at as a stellar population. And this possibility has gained, um, has, had, has caused a lot of excitement because we actually do know of stars that emit lots of gamma rays in pretty much this energy range, and they're called pulsars. So this a uh, picture on the right is an artist's impression of a pulsar, but as it, as it spins around, it beams out um, radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. So it can beam out radiation in the radio and in the X-ray all the way through to the gamma ray. Uh, this artist's impression is a particular kind of pulsar that is starting to spin faster and faster as it's consuming material from, it, from its partner star that is becoming a red giant and swelling to the point that it starts to dump material onto the pulsar. And that process can give you pulsars that rotate extremely rapidly, thousands of times a second. These millisecond pulsars are, are a particularly good candidate for the galactic center excess. So we've, met, we've seen millisecond pulsars elsewhere in the galaxy, and they make this kind of distribution of photons with energies around 1 to 3 GeV. You can ask, all right, would, would pulsars be distributed like this fuzzy blob? So if these pulsars were just in the disk of the galaxy, then they would not look very much like the galactic center excess that we see. But at the center of the Milky Way, there is a bulge containing many, many stars. And if the pulsars were distributed like that stellar bulge, they could potentially give you a gamma ray signal that looked like what we observe in the excess. So this is you know, hypothesis two. Hypothesis three is the one that particle, gets particle physicists um, very excited which is that maybe this could be telling us something about the dark matter of the universe. So this is the sort of one or two slide summary of last week's public lecture. But we have pretty good evidence that about 84% of the matter in the universe is dark. It has no electric charge and it interacts at most very weakly with known particles. And we have many lines of evidence for this statement and you can rewatch last week's public lecture if you're interested in hearing about some of them. The way the galaxies rotate, the way that colliding galaxy clusters behave, imprints left on the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the earliest light that we can see from the early history of the universe. And even the fact that galaxies exist and behave in the way that we observe them to all point to the existence of dark matter. But everything that we know about dark matter so far comes from observing its gravitational pull on the matter that we can see. So we've only ever detected it 
by its gravitational interactions with visible particles. Um, this is already enough, this already tells us enough about its properties to say that we don't really have any good candidates for dark matter within the physics we currently understand. So it's one of our biggest clues to what might lie beyond that, you know, the physics that we do understand today, but we don't really know what it is. So in many models of dark matter, but not all models of dark matter, it's possible for collisions between dark matter particles to produce visible particles. So the picture here is two dark matter particles come in, they crash together through some process that we don't understand, would like to understand, and they could make visible particles. And these visible particles, they could be the quarks that make up protons and neutrons, they could be leptons like electrons or muons or tau leptons, they could be the gauge bosons, by which I mean like the W boson, the Z boson, even the Higgs boson. When we produce these particles, just like proton-proton collisions producing pions earlier, they'll generally decay into particles that are more stable. And at the end of the day, and, and these processes can give us a signal of gamma rays. So this is another possible origin mechanism for gamma rays. It's like the proton-proton collisions we talked about earlier, but the particles doing the colliding would be these exotic dark matter particles. And if we could see a signal like this, it would be fantastic. It would revolutionize particle physics. There's also another thing that these collisions can do. If these collisions are happening a lot, they will reduce the amount of dark matter in the universe since they're converting dark matter into visible particles. So in the present day, we expect that rate of depletion to be very, very tiny, to be negligible. But if we extrapolate back to the very early universe when the universe was much more dense, then this depletion rate could actually have been pretty significant and could have actually been what fixes the amount of dark matter that we see today. Again, this isn't a guarantee. Not all models of dark matter even have a process like this. But in models of dark matter that do have a process like this, and where it was this depletion that fixed the observed amount of dark matter, we can figure out how fast this reaction should be from looking at how much dark matter there is in the present day. We can say, well, if the reaction was, fast, it was too fast, there would be not very much dark matter left. If it was too slow, there would be way more dark matter left. But in the Goldilocks case, where the dark matter had exactly the right interaction rate, we would see the observed amount of dark matter. So that gives us kind of a benchmark signal to look for. Can we see a process like this with the rate that matches what you would need to get the right dark matter abundance? So that's, so that's one thing that we can look for. We can look for a signal with a particular kind of rate making lots of gamma rays. So we can also ask the question of what, what should this signal look like on the sky? You know, should it look like the Fermi bubbles? Should it look like the fuzzy blob that we saw for the galactic center excess? And we actually have pretty good data on how the dark matter is distributed around our galaxy going back to the first studies in the 1970s by Vera Rubin and her collaborators, Gordon Thonard. So what they did was that they measured the rotation speed of stars and gas clouds around galaxies. And this cartoon is showing you sort of what they found. The expectation is that as you go further, so the big yellow dots in the center here represent where the mass of the galaxy is concentrated, where the visible matter is that we can see. So where we would guess the mass of the galaxy is concentrated because that's where all the stars and gas are. And then these yellow dots represent stars and gas clouds further out that are acting as tracer particles telling us about how strong the gravity of the galaxy is. What we expect is that as you go further out, um, these particles should slow down. Gravity is weaker out there, they should orbit more slowly. But what we actually see is shown on the right hand side that these tracer particles at large distances from the galaxy orbit just as fast as the ones closer in. So that tells you the gravity is stronger in the outskirts than we expected, and we hypothesize that that's because there is actually a lot of dark matter out there and what we're seeing is its gravitational pull. So from this, we infer that while the part of the Milky Way that we can see is the spiral galaxy that I showed you um, on the, back on the first slide, it's surrounded by a large halo of dark matter that extends out much further than the galactic disk. So this is something that we can look for for a dark matter signal. We can look, so look for a signal that resembles the dark matter halo, not the disk of our Milky Way and close to the galactic center, that would look like a roughly spherical fuzzy blob, which is indeed what we see. So the dark matter hypothesis gets us the shape of the signal right. It can also explain in more detail like why this profile is very peaked out at the galactic center, but it extends a long way out. We would expect dark matter to sort of fall and clump in the center of the galaxy just due to gravity, but we expect the halo, halo to extend out a long way. Perhaps the most interesting part of the galactic center access for those people who think it might be dark matter is that the rate of collisions that you would need to make the galactic center excess with dark matter seems to line up extremely well with the rate of collisions that you would need to deplete dark matter to its observed value. So that's interesting. It might just be a coincidence, um, but it's interesting. 
And the fact that the signal sort of has its peak at one to three GeV and that this is basically the same everywhere is very natural in the dark matter scenario because you know, it's that, that energy peak is just controlled by what, the tip of, by what the mass of the dark matter particle is. So it should be the same everywhere. Okay, so we've got these hypotheses. How, how might we tell them apart? And that's really been the question for people working in this area for, for the last several years. So one possibility is that we can look at the shape of the signal on the sky. So the dark matter signal, I just said, it should be roughly spherical, like this dark matter halo. The pulsar distribution, we don't know in as much detail, but you know, I showed you back on that first slide, the Milky Way does have this big bulge of stars at the center. It would be reasonable to expect the pulsar distribution to resemble that bulge. And of course, if we have some kind of outflow going on, we could have some kind of much more complicated shape, like the Fermi bubbles. So far, the data seems broadly consistent with both option one and option two. It's somewhat hard to distinguish this thing that is really spherical from this thing that is just semi-spherical um, because of uncertainties in the background, because of uncertainties with how you model the emission associated with this galactic disk and all the gas and starlight associated with it. There have been some studies that found that two was a better description than one. There have also been studies that found that one was a better description than two. But that's a place where if we could really map out the distribution better, we would potentially be able to use it to get a handle on this. A second possibility, which I think will be really exciting over the next few years, is that we could look for counterpart signals in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So I told you that dark matter collisions could produce all kinds of standard model particles in principle. There are ongoing searches for all of these kinds of particles. So if we could find a counterpart to those, that might be a big clue in favor of the dark matter interpretation. On the other hand, pulsars also emit across the electromagnetic spectrum. They beam in radio and X-ray, as well as in gamma rays. And we don't have firm detections of, uh, of any counterpart pulsars for this region yet, but there are new radio telescopes, in particular the Meerkat telescope in South Africa, which have the potential to find many pulsars from this population. And we're just scrutinizing the inner galaxy. And so you know, we could find these pulsars really any time now. So that would be another like, really good way to disentangle the possibilities. The third possibility, which I was very excited about a couple of years ago, but now I'm somewhat less excited about, is that we can just try to say, okay, well, pulsars are stars. You know, dark matter annihilation, there would be, it would be like a, the halo is a cloud of dark matter around the center of the galaxy. If I'm looking at the sky and I want to tell the difference between like a bunch of stars or a cloud, Unless my eyesight is pretty bad, it's not that hard to tell the difference. The stars are a bunch of bright points on the sky and the cloud is just something smooth. So similarly, we can look at the clumpiness of the photons. If we're looking at dark matter, we might expect a fairly smooth distribution of photons. Whereas if we're looking at stars, we would expect to see hotspots coinciding with the positions of the pulsars. Now, the thing that makes this difficult is twofold. One is that Fermi, the telescope has kind of bad eyesight. Um, from Fermi's perspective, a star on the sky looks like the moon. So um, the size of the moon or sun on the sky is about, the size of the moon is about half a degree on the sky. Fermi takes the photons from any individual star and spreads them out over that region. So any star to Fermi looks roughly the size of the moon. Uh, that means that when you have a lot of stars close up to each other, it can be hard to tell them apart because the photons from them will all overlap. The second problem is that background that I told you about, you know, back early on, the background coming from charged particles interacting with the gas and starlight. And uh, that background is about 10 times as bright as this excess. So we need to, so, you know, uh, get, getting rid of that and figuring out what we're looking at is pretty challenging. And uh, that's it. We can devise statistical methods to try to tell the difference between the two. And back in 2015 and 2016, my group and many others claim that we had pretty good evidence, you know, our, our methods were telling us that we had pretty good evidence that it was this scenario and that what we were looking at was a bunch of individual pulsars, not a signal from something smooth like dark matter or cosmic rays interacting with the gas and starlight. However, then over the last couple of years, my collaborator Rebecca Lean and I dug into this a bit more and we actually found that it's possible to fake this evidence for point sources if you get your background model even just a little bit wrong. Or other groups also looked at this and found that there are hotspots in this area, but many of them have nothing to do with the galactic center. They just happen to be in the same direction on the sky as the galactic center. That said, in this year, there have been a number of studies that say that there still seems to be some evidence for point sources associated with the excess. So maybe this kind of way of searching for the pulsars is still, is still alive. 
There are many new techniques being applied, um, including methods using machine learning and neural networks to try to separate a pulsar signal from a dark matter signal. So as I said, at the start of the talk, these are puzzles. I don't have the answer for you yet, but, uh, but stay tuned. So I think that's the end of my time. So I'm gonna wrap up. I hope I've given you a little bit of a glimpse into what the gamma ray sky can tell us about our galaxy and the unexpected signals that we have found there that we didn't know about and we weren't anticipating prior to looking at these data for the first time. We've seen the Fermi bubbles. We've discovered the Fermi bubbles, which are these giant high energy structures centered at the galactic center. And we believe are due to a past outflow from the region around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And the galactic center excess remains an open puzzle. It's a bright excess of gamma rays from the inner galaxy and galactic center with energies billion times out of visible light. The origin is still somewhat of an open question. It may well be telling us about a new and unexpected pulsar population in the inner, in the inner galaxy. However, these recent analyses have shown that maybe we cannot completely rule out the dark matter annihilation and outflow hypotheses just yet. So hope I've given a bit of you a bit of a window on research in this area and these open questions. And I'll take questions at this point. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Tracy, for a great talk. Um, yeah. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Okay. So uh, Barbara. Okay. Uh, hello, um, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, this is Michael, Barbara's husband. And Hi. I'm wondering if you can observe galaxies other than our own with your instruments and what opportunities that might give you to refine your um, various hypotheses. That's a really excellent question. So the question is, yeah, right. So. Fermi is an all-sky instrument, so it can definitely see other galaxies. The problem is, well, they mentioned part, part of the problem is that Fermi's eyesight is kind of blurry. So um, it's very hard to resolve in detail. So that means that distant galaxies from Fermi's perspective uh, just look like point sources. So we can measure the total aggregate emission from that galaxy, um, but it can be hard to figure out if that emission has a distribution that looks like the Fermi bubbles or looks like the galactic center excess or looks like the galactic disk. All we see is just the total gamma ray emission. That said, there are some exceptions. Um, the closest galaxy to us, the, um, the Andromeda galaxy, is actually, you know, Fermi can resolve some of its structure. And there have been some claims. There was a claim a few years ago that there was some emission around Andromeda that was more consistent with the Fermi bubbles-like structure than, um, the, than, than the disk of the galaxy but it wasn't very highly significant. More recently, there have been some studies that look at the total emission from Andromeda and say that it might have a bump in the sort of one to three GeV energy range, similar to what we see at the center of the Milky Way. Um, I, this, is, this is a really interesting possible signal. That's it, a challenge with these analyses is that because we live inside the Milky Way galaxy, whenever we look at Andromeda, we have to look at it through the Milky Way galaxy. And so, and it can be hard to, to remove that background. And so that's a potential confounder. But if Andromeda really does have this like excess of one to three GeV gamma ray emission, that's, it's really interesting. It's interesting for a couple of reasons because in the Milky Way, this emission is a very, is a small fraction of the total. Like we can see it in the galactic center, but only because we can zoom in on the galactic center and look just at that region. If you ask what, how much, you know, power is there as a fraction of the total gamma rays from our galaxy, I think it's less than 1%. Um, but in Andromeda, you, you see this like even in the aggregate emission and it appears to be you know, spread out and not really tracing the disk of the galaxy. So there have been some proposals that maybe you could do this if what you're looking at is dark matter annihilation and the dark matter halo of Andromeda has lots of little clumps of dark matter in it that enhance the annihilation rate. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a, um, it, it, I, I don't think we really understand what's going on in Andromeda yet, but, it, but it's definitely a potential alternative handle on this. The, the other potential alternative handle is that we can look at um, satellite galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way. So these are dwarf satellite galaxies, and they tend to have a very large dark matter content and are not expected to have very many pulsars in them. So if we saw a clear signal from one of those, it would be, and, and, we, act, and we can see these in Fermi, and Fermi searches for emission from them, it would be you know, a nice signal in support of the dark matter hypothesis. And 
they um and that search has been done for a long time at the moment we don't have a clear positive signal but we also can't we also our sensitivity is not good enough to clearly eliminate the dark matter hypothesis based on those observations there was there was a study a few years ago which looked at another um, satellite of the Milky Way, which is thought to not have much dark matter associated with it, and saw a signal with an energy spectrum that did look like the galactic center excess. And the authors of that paper said, oh, well, you know, we think that maybe there really is a dark matter halo around this object, and it's close enough that we would know if there were pulsars in it, and there aren't any pulsars in it, so then this signal could only come from dark matter annihilation. Uh, uh, unfortunately for the dark matter uh, hypothesis supporters, what happened in this case was that then a bunch of people said, huh, that's interesting. Let's do a follow-up and see if we can find pulsars uh, in this system. And the follow-up found a bunch of pulsars in the system. So then it turned out that the gamma ray signal that they had seen from that region at one to three GeV really was coming from pulsars. So you, you might take that as an indication for the galactic center that, you know, that, that it may be that as we do better pulsar searches there, maybe the same thing will happen that we will find many pulsars and, and this will, this the, the excess will turn out to have been the first sign of a brand new pulsar population that we didn't know about before in the galactic bulge. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way set some constraints on the dark matter hypothesis and they would be a great counterpart, but we're just not quite at the sensitivity level yet to be able to do a clean separation between the two hypotheses, but, but it's a great question. Good. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, I see there were some grammar comments in the chat. I apologize for the plural data. I'm usually careful about that one. Farther and further, I think, is a US versus Australian English thing, which I haven't run into before. So I will, you know, that, that one I will blame on my uh, Australian heritage. Um, right. So Charlie, I guess, asked um, if visible matter tends to contract upon itself as a gravity. Well, why doesn't that happen with dark matter? Yeah, this is, um, I'll answer that. And then I see Catherine has her hand up. Yeah, um, yeah, Catherine, yeah. I guess, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is actually a really interesting question. So, the reason, so, you might ask that this is the question about like why dark matter doesn't just collapse down into the spiral disk is kind of related to the question of why haven't the planets all fallen into the sun? Like, you know, it, I mean, the, the planets are orbiting the sun, they're experiencing gravity. Why don't they fall into the sun? It's because they have angular momentum and they don't like have an easy way to get rid of that angular momentum and fall down into the sun. Uh, and it's similar for dark matter. In our standard models of dark matter, they have very small interactions with anything else. And in particular, they can't radiate photons or other light particles, So, which means that it's hard for them to get rid of energy and angular momentum. So a dark matter particle that starts out on a circular orbit around the galaxy will just keep going in a circular orbit around the galaxy. Whereas ordinary matter, which like ordinary matter, you know, it can be heat, it can be heated up and then it can emit photons and that carries away energy and angular momentum. Ordinary particles can bounce off each other through electromagnetic forces, which are much stronger than gravitational forces. And this allows the ordinary matter to spin down into this spiral disk galaxy. But the dark matter, because it's not interacting, just keeps going around in circles, more or less. Now, th this isn't completely true. There are, there's, a there's an effect called gravithermal instability that would cause like, the dark matter halo to eventually collapse in itself over long times, but gravity is so weak that for the, the time scale for this to happen in a Milky Way-like halo is much longer than the present day age of the universe. But if you say, okay, what if dark matter did have some interaction, like not like the standard model, but had some interaction with other dark matter particles that was much stronger than gravity, um, then this collapse happens much faster. And so you can actually predict that in some dark matter halos might have collapsed in on themselves and could be very dense at the centers. Um, but only if there's a only if there's a strong interaction, and then it looked like Catherine. You yeah, had to yeah, Catherine. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, um, I am a non-scientist, so this is a very fundamental question. But how, as a practical matter, do you measure the gamma rays? Uh, you, this was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Well, so that's yeah, that's that's an awesome question. 
so yeah, and, and it's a question where the, the answer is like the careers of experimental physicists. So, you know, I, as a, I'm a theorist and I largely take advantage of the skills of my experimental colleagues in this measure. So the way that we measure these gamma rays is we need to build custom design instruments. The one that we were using here was the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope is basically a box that has um, many layers of silicon inside it. And, um, and at the bottom of this, and these silicon strips are highly instrumented so that when um, a particle hits one of the silicon strips, you get like a little, uh, I, I think it's like a, a little electronic signal used to use for, you know, a little bit of current that goes to one of the detectors on the side of the sheet. So what happens when a gamma ray hits the front of Fermi is that we hope that, so some gamma rays will just go straight through Fermi, come out the other side, never get detected. That's, that's kind of unavoidable. But we hope that most gamma rays, when they hit these silicon strips, they will, um, they will undergo an interaction process that causes them to produce a positron and electron. So they've got enough energy that you know, E equals mc squared, energy can convert into mass. The, so the incoming gamma ray will convert some of its energy into an electron and a positron. And then that electron and positron will keep going through the Fermi detector and they'll hit each subsequent layer. So what you'll get is like little spots lighting up on each subsequent layer, telling you about the progress of, the, of these charged particles, this electron and positron through the detector. And so that gives you like two, um, two lines through the detector. So then you can triangulate, you can trace these lines back to their origin point, and that tells you where the gamma ray came in from, uh, you know, what it was, what, where, where, it, where it hit the detector, what, what direction it was coming from. And you can also, at the bottom of Fermi, there's a calorimeter, which ba is basically, you know, just like a dense piece of material that stop that stops the particles and um, so where they can slow down and and you know deposit all their remaining energy as i i don't actually know the details of how fermi's calorimeter works but usually like it's a some combination of heat and vibration so you measure that that heat and vibration and you measure the track of the particles through the detector the track tells you where the photon came where the gamma ray came from in the first place and how much, and the, you know, and like the heating of the detector tells you how, or, you know, or, or similar methods of uh, measuring the energy deposition tell you how much energy the incoming gamma ray had to begin with. And so that's basically what we use to make these maps for each photon. Um, the Fermi collaboration looks at this shower of particles coming as a result of the gamma ray hitting the detector and reconstructs a best estimate for what direction they came from and what energy they have. And that's the data that is in their public data set that they share with people like me or you. Um, from which we can then make these maps of where the photons came from on the sky. But yeah, the, the details of how, I mean, the details of how to build these detectors and uh, and these trade and and the trade-offs in building them is is a really complicated question. Like just for example, I mean, I told you that one of the problems with Fermi is that, you know, its eyesight gets a bit blurry and that's especially true at lower energies. Once you get down to energies below about one GeV um, to Fermi, you know, anything, I mean, it's, it's not even like blurring things out to the size of the moon anymore. It's blurring things out to, you know, 10 times the size of the sun or moon. And it turns out that the reason that Fermi's eyesight is bad at low energies is because what can happen is that the gamma ray comes in, you know, it hits one of the layers, bounces off, but doesn't make a pair, hits one of the other layers, bounces off, doesn't make a pair, and then only makes a pair when it's already bounced around a couple of times in the detector. And that makes it really hard to reconstruct where that photon originally came from. So, um, so, so it turns out that you can actually make Fermi better for low energy particles by like throwing out half the, half the experiment. <laughs> like you can make a version of Fermi that is better for low energy particles just by having fewer layers. So there is less opportunity for the photon to bounce around. So you know, there are cases like that where there's a trade-off. Do you see fewer photons, but do you manage to reconstruct their direction more accurately? And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a community of experts in building these machines and figuring out what these trade-offs are who do really interesting work. So Tracy, um, is that named for Enrico Fermi? Uh, yes. So yeah, that, that's right. And uh, so I see one more question about how long do you expect the Fermi telescope to be providing information? So it Fermi has very little in the way of expendable parts. Like there is a fuel supply on board, which could potentially be used up, but it doesn't use its fuel for its basic orbit. It only uses the fuel when it has to like move to dodge, you know, space junk, which has happened a couple of times. But as a consequence of that, it really hasn't used much of its fuel and it has a lot of fuel left. So 
it can stay so it can stay up there basically so long as we continue providing funding to pay the people who are monitoring it and taking data from it and telling it what to do. I think it's been uh, I do not remember exactly when it has been approved to, but at the moment it's on a two year approval cycle. So like every year, the FOMI collaboration goes back to NASA and say, hey, we would like to keep running the instrument for another two years. And there's a review panel and NASA decides whether it's cost effective to keep it running for another couple of years uh, or, or, to, or to shut it down and devote the money to other um, sources. But, and so the argument in favor of shutting it down sooner rather than later would be, you know, this is a full sky instrument and we've got 13 years of data at this point. So we have a pretty great image of the sky and running it for another like one or two years isn't going to improve too much on that 13 years of data. But on the other hand, there are events that are transient, like they happen once, they flash, they go away, like gamma ray bursts or like photons associated with uh, neutron star mergers, that kind of thing. And Fermi is really still like by far the best window that we have on this particular energy range. And once it starts off operating, we will not have an equally good or like close to equally good window on this energy range for any of those transient events. So that's that's kind of what the trade-off is at the moment. But but I mean in principle, if nothing, you know, if nothing breaks, if nothing goes wrong, Fermi could just keep going around the earth for, for the foreseeable future. It it does like it's had, I mean it is possible something could break. Like it's its original planned mission lifetime was 10 years. So that was over in 2018. So it's already, you know, out beyond um out beyond its warranty period. But um so it, it had one issue, which they called a shoulder injury a couple of years ago, where one of the solar panels got stuck. Um, and so this has been fixed by basically changing how it orients itself to the sun so that that solar panel like, can still provide power and doesn't heat up too much. But you know, like that's an example of a thing that can go wrong. Like if Fermi stops working, then that, that's likely what the problem will be, like something gets stuck and we can't get it unstuck. Um, so yeah, uh, and then I see another question in the chat about like, if there's dark matter, you know, does this give a hint of what type of dark matter it may be? Well, of course, if the galactic center accesses pulsars, it doesn't really tell us very much about dark matter. It tells us about a pulsar population, but we don't get a ton of information about dark matter. If it did turn out, like if, so, so yes, let's, let's imagine the particle physicist dream scenario. Suppose that there's an experiment called the GAPS experiment, which is going to fly on a balloon, which is going to look for um, anti-deuterons, which is, so this is a rare, so this is, so a deuteron is a rare kind of nucleus. Um, an anti-deuteron is the same thing, but made out of antimatter. So these things are expected to be extremely rare. They're extremely hard to make through ordinary processes, but you could maybe make them through dark matter annihilation or decay if it's the same kind of dark matter annihilation as the leading dark matter hypotheses for the galactic center excess. So imagine the gaps flies in a couple of years and it finds a bunch of anti-deuterons that are consistent with the galactic center excess. And imagine that simultaneously we find some close by dwarf satellite galaxies in the Milky Way and they're shining in gamma rays with this kind of energy spectrum. At that point, we might start to say, oh, huh, Maybe this is really a dark matter signal that we're looking at. Maybe the, the evidence of some point sources towards the excess was just a red herring or like just a confusion with the background. And if that happened, then it would tell us a ton about dark matter. Like if that was the case, it would tell us that dark matter, no, or at least some significant fraction of dark matter is likely some kind of a new fundamental particle with a mass scale between about 10 GeV and 100 GeV. So that's about 10. So another way to say a GeV, if we convert it into mass by e equals mc squared, it's about the mass of a proton. So this would be a new particle about 10 to 100 times heavier than a proton. Uh, we would know exact, that, that interacts with um, the quarks in the standard model. We would be able to read off its interaction strength from the strength of the excess. Um, so it would be, so, so this would tell us that there is a kind of dark matter model that is much more like a classic weakly interacting massive particle than an axion. So yeah, if we confirmed it to be a dark matter signal, it would tell us a ton about dark matter. Um, but that is a big if. So. Okay, great. Yeah, so we have already, um, now it's 636. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, thanks Tracy again for a great talk. And thanks everybody for coming and for the uh, many good questions. Yeah, so see you next time. See you next time. Thanks very much, everyone.